morning, everybody. We're very happy to have you with us for a discussion of, of one of the most complex and uh, and also threatening problems that we're trying to work with uh, across the Americas um, between Mexico and the United States, but uh, between many other countries uh, around the world, and that's the, the threat generated by synthetic opioids and fentanyl. We're going to have the opportunity today to hear from a range of experts who are working on this problem from different angles. And it is such a complex problem that we, we need to understand all the different perspectives in trying to tackle it. It's a, a problem that is very complex for authorities uh, on both sides of the US-Mexico border to deal with. Um, if, if you just think about it, it's much more easy to make and produce than other deadly drugs that we've faced before. Uh, it's very easy to transport. Um, thus, it's harder to, for authorities to detect it, to intercept it at the border. Um, and, and, and there need to be adjustments to what we're doing, both on the law enforcement and justice side of this, and then also clearly on the demand side, since we've seen skyrocketing demand uh, in the United States for this. I had the pleasure of being the U.S. ambassador to Mexico. And when I first went to Mexico, we were looking at marijuana, cocaine, and then we started to see a rise in heroin. Um, but that was clearly quickly outpaced in five or so years ago, six years ago, by the production of synthetic opioids coming into the United States. And as I always mention to people, uh, drug smugglers may be bad people, and that they don't obey the laws and, and they're just trying to make money, but they're not stupid people. And they saw a market in the United States that had developed out of uh, illicit sales from pharmacies and others of people who were seeking opioids and they moved to meet that demand. And they have, they have uh, sadly overmet it. If you look at the seizures at the U.S. border of fentanyl, the southwest border, they're up over 600 percent since 2018. And of course, as, as most of you know, that's reflected in the sharp rise in overdose deaths in the United States, uh, total being about 107, 108,000 in the last several years, but about 60 percent or so of that coming from fentanyl. So this is a, it's a massive problem. Um, it's also become a very, very sharp political issue of debate in the United States, as we know from um, some of the, the recent proposals and uh, and debates of of potential candidates going forward. It's also be it's also been a challenge for U.S. Mexico law enforcement and just justice cooperation. That cooperation um, has deteriorated over the past 10 years um, for a number of reasons, which we won't get into, um, but uh, it, it, it's going, it's, takes and demands a lot of work for improvement to meet this new threat, because this is a more complex threat, a different kind of threat than we faced before, um, where there were already some shortcomings to what we were doing. <laughs> um, there's been a, a new start to rebuild this cooperation in the last 18 months or so uh, with a framework that's looking at both the demand side and the supply side of drugs. Um, the real challenge now is for this new framework to start producing results, results that save people's lives. And so that's what part of what we're talking about here. And what that that also means is that we have to be willing to confront with with facts and ideas some of the proposals that are throw, being thrown out for how to solve this problem, um, which involve the use of military force in, the, in a number of cases. And they're proposals that, one, are very unlikely to solve the problem, even, even from a, a, a law enforcement side or a stopping the drug side. And they have a high likelihood of setting off a broader crisis in, in the relationship between the United States and Mexico. So there's a large space for presenting a sophisticated and multifaceted strategy 
that people can understand that is likely to produce good results. And so this conversation today and others that we're trying to sponsor at the Wilson Center um, is are, are aimed at trying to develop that alternative picture of how we uh, deal with this uh, this terribly complex and 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 deadly problem that's affecting both sides of the border, the United States clearly, but also increasingly we're seeing the effects of this uh, directly in Mexico. Um, and we've already seen it, of course, in the violence created by the cartel groups fighting to control the smuggling routes to the United States. So it's, it's a great pleasure to have so many good experts here to talk about this. And it is my pleasure to uh, introduce Sharice Phillips, Sharice is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement. She is a career diplomat with long service in, uh, in Latin America, as well as other places around the world. Um, but I think last came from being the, the number two person at our embassy in Bolivia. And she is now overseeing a number of the cooperative efforts between the United States and Mexico uh, to confront the problems related to fentanyl and synthetic opioids. So Sharice, thank you so much for being with us and let me invite you to make some remarks. You just need to unmute yourself. <laughs> There we go, and thank you so much, there. Ambassador. I appreciate that that introduction. Uh, it's great to be back at the Wilson Center, even if only virtually this time. And I want to give a a warm thank you to our distinguished colleagues, uh, all of you at the Wilson Center. We we in the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement and other parts of the State Department rely on your continued scholarship and and deep expertise and also warm greetings to today's panelists as well. I'm so pleased to be able to lay out the INL view on US-Mexican solutions to the fentanyl crisis. Uh, I've been intrigued by the cross-border relationship uh, ever since I processed visas at our embassy in Mexico City nearly 40 years ago. Uh, but I have to admit, uh, I, I took up this portfolio last year coming from uh, Bolivia, where I was the permanent charge, and I thought they wanted me for my expertise on cocaine. I couldn't even spell fentanyl at the time. Uh, and since then, there has just been this enormous interest that has surged throughout the, our, our federal government and also at the state and local level. So I'd like to take this chance to talk briefly about the synthetic opioid threat with, with, with which unfortunately we've all become well acquainted and then touch on the approach the US government is taking. So please bear with me today as I know some of this will not be news uh, to, to everyone uh, listening. I'm also going to say a little bit about the challenges Mexico faces as fentanyl manufacturing and trafficking has rapidly evolved. And of course, about how we are working as partners uh, to address the public health aspects of this threat to, to all of North America and the global challenge a vast and growing precursor chemical industry presents. And before I get any farther, I'd, for those of you who follow this topic, please be aware that Secretary of State Anthony Blinken will be speaking on this very topic at the UN General Assembly later today and those remarks will be available on INL's social media feeds. So consider this something of a warm up act and please be sure to follow INL on Twitter and Instagram. So synthetic opioids, but especially illicit fentanyl remain a devastating threat to the United States and globally due to their extreme lethality and the ease with which drug traffickers can produce them. Unlike some prior narcotics threats, 
These drugs do not take up vast rural acreage to produce or take months to grow. They don't require expert chemical chemists to, to oversee the process to be converted into narcotics. And they're not bulky to transport or, uh, and they're not uh, easy to detect. Uh, as you are probably all aware, fentanyl production requires no large or elaborate infrastructure. In fact, a lab can be set up in someone's home in the suburbs. The labs don't send out the stereotypical signs of smell and excessive electrical use. The ingredients are often perfectly licit chemicals obtained by illicit means. In fact, fentanyl itself is legal in many countries as a tremendously useful pain reliever for, for terminally ill patients. And many medical experts think it should stay this way. And of course, in logistical terms, synthetic drugs are often easily trafficked through the mail or hidden in very small loads that move across our border through lawful ports of entry. Indeed, the vast majority of fentanyl coming into the US is brought in that way at legal border crossings in, in fairly small packages, uh, even though it may be thousands of pills at a time. And yet fentanyl is so potent that even small amounts can be lethal. One Pill Can Kill is DEA's awareness campaign that many state and local communities have adopted here in the United States as we seek to turn the tide of this devastating epidemic. Fentanyl is often mixed with heroin, cocaine, or meth, or, or added to counterfeit tablets and ingested unknowingly by the consumer. It can be sold under fake brand names in otherwise legitimate pharmacies by corrupt employees. And the pills themselves can come in all sizes and shapes. Uh, these products are actually cheap to make logistically simple to transport and result in enormous profits to traffickers. The United States is confronting this threat on multiple fronts. And so it goes without saying that robust engagement with international partners is essential for this purpose. And that's why my office in the US State Department is involved. In 2019, the People's Republic of China scheduled all fentanyl related substances as a controlled class. And since then, most of the fentanyl seized in the United States has come via Mexico using precursor chemicals sourced from the PRC, private companies, and diverted to illicit drug production. Our partnership with Mexico is therefore absolutely key to the success of efforts to combat the fentanyl crisis. And we do have a robust cooperative effort with the Mexican government. Our programming focuses on building Mexican capacity to A, reduce drug production, B, inhibit the illicit cross-border movement of drugs, and C, investigate, prosecute, and deny revenue to the transnational criminal organizations that traffic narcotics. As you have seen in the headlines and as Mexican officials report, conflicts over control of territory and drug smuggling routes cause regular spikes in violence and other criminal activity. Our partnership under the US-Mexico Bicentennial Framework for Security, Public Health and Safe Communities enshrines our commitments to our shared goals of protecting our people, preventing cross-border crime, and pursuing transnational criminal networks. INL helps with technical assistance in a range of areas. For instance, uh, we've provided more than 500 canines to multiple Mexican agencies to assist in seizures of fentanyl and other drugs, weapons, and contraband. These canines have supported over 50 fentanyl seizures by Mexico, more than 485,000 fentanyl pills and, and growing. 
INL also partners with Mexico to support alternative sentencing, drug treatment, and drug prevention programs. There's much more that remains to be done as the volume and potency of dangerous drugs entering the United States from Mexico remains high. And of course, violent crime in Mexico is fueled by transnational criminal organizations and also remains alarmingly high. Both countries acknowledge more needs to be done. The U.S. will continue to partner with Mexico, and we applaud Mexican global leadership to counter the synthetic drug threat. This year, the White House launched a trilateral fentanyl committee that brought in Canadian participation, building on and elevating our North American cooperation to address the shared threat across all of North America. We have broadened our partnership beyond law enforcement efforts to better incorporate other aerials critical to disrupting the fentanyl supply chain. For example, that would include working with Mexican rec regulators and public health agencies and pursuing private sector engagement as we seek to tackle the challenge of synthetic drugs from all angles. We also leverage sanctions and rewards programs to complement and support U.S. and fentanyl law enforcement efforts to bring those involved in the illicit fentanyl supply chain to justice. Domestically, as many of you are aware, the United States is spending $22.4 billion, half of our total counter-narcotic budget, on treatment. Some federal programs in, in this area include $279 million in CDC awards to link people to life-saving care and $80 million to rural communities to respond to the overdose risk from fentanyl and other opioids. In July, Secretary of State Blinken hosted a virtual meeting to establish a global coalition to address synthetic drug threats. And more than 80 countries and multinational organizations participated at a senior level and enthusiastically agreed that a global threat can only be met by a multinational coalition. We're looking to further the work of that coalition around the margins of the UN General Assembly in New York this week. Uh, and, and I want to emphasize that uh, the enthusiasm with which our invitation was seized and the, the high level participation, the, the overwhelming uh, yes to our uh, request for, for a multinational coalition has really been encouraging, but it also shows how this is truly a, a global uh, problem. So in short, we're taking a holistic approach to this challenge working multilaterally, in fact, emphasizing the public health issues along with the need to disrupt, dis, uh, disrupt traffic networks and reduce supply. But we are also engaging the private sector with know your customer and other reputational risk education. We are sharing our expertise and funding programs that help detect fentanyl, deter trafficking, train law enforcement officers, and educate communities at risk. So this is a different approach than we have taken in the past uh, in counter narcotics. It is one that, that embraces a, a multi, uh, multi, multiple of, of approaches uh, that are not just focused on interdiction and law enforcement, but at the same time, uh, we are aware that the, the cartels that are trafficking uh, drugs uh, get much of their money uh, from uh, their cocaine trafficking, and that this in itself destabilizes economies, destabilizes uh, societies, and threatens democracy. So it's not that we are ignoring uh, the other approaches that we've taken, particularly on cocaine coming through the region, but that we are taking a more global and, and multifaceted approach. I'd love to be able to take any of your questions now, but unfortunately, I'm not able to stay online. Uh, so please don't forget to sign up to INL social media. 
uh, so you can see the secretary remarks on this important subject at UNGA. And I hope you will have a fruitful discussion today. I look forward to hearing more about it. And I, I wish all of you good luck in, in much success in what you're doing to educate communities and advocate for appropriate policies. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Des Phillips, Sharice. Thanks for being with us and for giving that excellent perspective of, of the wide range of initiatives you are undertaking with your USG colleagues and international coalition, as you just mentioned, all needed. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. I'm turning it over to you, Leila, right? Thank yeah. you so much, Ambassador Wayne, and thank you to our Deputy Assistant Secretary, Sharice Phillips. And on behalf of the Mexico Institute, I want to thank everybody that's connected here uh, today, and a, a special uh, thanks to all of our great panelists. I am very excited to have such a renowned group of individuals speaking on such an important issue uh, for Mexico and U.S. relations. I now have um, the honor to introduce Francisco Rivas. He's the president of the National Citizen Observatory of Security, Justice, and Legality in Mexico, who's going to briefly introduce our panelists. So, Francisco, thank you so much for joining us here today and for co-sponsoring this event with the Mexico Institute and with UCSD. Thank you very much, Lila. We in the National Citizens Observatory are very honored to share this project with uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center. Ambassador Wayne, Lila, thank you very much for considering the Observatory, National Citizens Observatory as a partner. No further, thank you to the panelists that today will help us to reflect about this challenge, this specific challenge, as the ambassador says, is uh, right now one of the top, uh, maybe the first one problem between Mexico and United States. So uh, let me introduce Dr. Jaime Redondo. Dr. Jaime Redondo is the new Canada Research Church in Substance Use and Health Policy Research. He's an assistant professor at the School of Public Health and Social Policy and scientist with the Canadian Institute of Substance Use Research. He is graduated from uh, UCSD in his uh, PhD and also in his master's. Then we have uh, Victoria Dietmar. She works since uh, 2016 uh, with Inside Crime. She has a lot of experience in the field, uh, working in, in projects about Mexico and Latin America. Victoria holds a Master of Science in Psychology from University of Oxford, where she focuses on exploring criminal governance and subnational expansion of organized crime groups in Mexico. Then uh, I want to thank Myra Hines. She is the head of the International Inter-American, sorry, uh, American Observatory on Drugs, the Research and Analyst Branch of the Inter-American Drug Abuse Control Commission, where she has worked since 1997, uh, where she developed uh, and leads program to monitor and evaluate the drug problem in the Western Hemisphere. She received her Master in Health Science from uh, John Hopkins Bloomer School of Public Health with a focus on drug and alcohol addiction and related mental health condition. I want to thank you, Dr. Daniel Ciccarone. Dan, uh, Dr. Ciccarone is a board uh, certified client, clinical in family and addiction medicine and professor of family and community medicine in the School of Medicine at the UCSF. Um, is a recognized international scholar of the medical public health and public policy dimension of substance abuse, risk, and consequence. Associate Director for the International Journal of Drug Policy and recently edited an International Journal of Drug Policy, Special Issues on the Triple Wave Crisis of Opioids, Heroin, and Fentanyl in the U.S. Uh, last and not least, we have Greg Bergman, Executive Director of A New Path, Parents for Addiction, Treatment and Healthy, a nonprofit organization of parents, concerned citizens and community leaders working together to promote a better understanding of 
uh, a treatment for the disease of addiction. In 2010, she started a national campaign called Moms United to End the War of Drugs, where she is the lead organizer. Gretchen served as state chairwoman for, Prop uh, for Proposition 36, which has passed by California voters in November 2000, mandating treatment instead of inclusion for nonviolent drug offer. Thank you very much all. And Lila, thank you as, uh, again for this project, the first of a uh, long range of projects. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francisco, and, and again, thank you to all of the great panelists that are here with us today. I don't want to repeat a lot of the information and insight that we've already heard this morning, but I think it's important to point out that fentanyl and other opioids are fueling the worst crisis in the history of the United States. And as Ambassador Wayne alluded to, this has also become an increasing problem in Mexico. But according to the National Center for Health Statistics, more than 1,500 people per week die from some type of opioid, making opioids by far the leading cause of fatal overdoses in the country. Fentanyl is 50 times more potent than heroin and approximately 100 times more potent than, than morphine. So while the opioid problem may have started with the overprescription of legal pain medications in the United States, it has intensified in recent years, as we've heard from others this morning, due to the inflow of cheap heroin and synthetic opioids, particularly fentanyl, which have been supplied by foreign drug cartels. The epidemic has a direct impact on the US and Mexican economies and represents a threat to national security on both sides of the border. So to start off this uh, conversation with all of you, and this is an opening question, each panelist will have about four to five minutes to respond. It's a big question, but it's just sort of to get the conversation started. And, and once we've heard from all of you, we'll move into a more dynamic, moderated conversation. But my first question to all of you is, how did we get here? And what recommendations would you provide to authorities, both in Mexico and the United States, to combat this crisis that you know we're seeing with uh, synthetic opioids? So Victoria, why don't we start with you and, and then we'll continue with the rest of our great panelists. Great, yeah, thank you, Lila. Um, before I begin, I'd like to thank you again uh, for considering me for this panel. It's really an honor to be here at a Wilson Center event and with such a great lineup of panelists. Um, just for context, we are at Inside Crime have been following the illicit fentanyl trade and the precursor chemical flow for a few years now. And we actually just came back from a week of field work um, in Culiacán, Sinaloa, which as you may know, has been the epicenter of synthetic drug production for a few years now. And we interviewed uh, several actors involved in the fentanyl trade, mostly on the production side of things. Um, so I'd like to kick off my participation by sharing a bit of <laughs> what we have found along the way and particularly during this past week, uh, which as you may know was very interesting given the recent extradition of uh, Ovidio Guzman who has indictments uh, in the US related to fentanyl trafficking. Um, so first of all, I mean, I don't want to repeat uh, what Deputy Assistant Secretary Phillips mentioned, uh, but fentanyl has been a game changer for criminal organizations in Mexico. Because again, it is, uh, you know, it's a very potent uh, substance. Uh, there is a high potential for overlap between the, the licit, mar like licit market, because uh, several substances uh, used in the production of many legal uses. Uh, it's relatively easy to smuggle compared to other drugs. It requires low initial investment. So what we've seen uh, and compared to other drugs is that it is a highly decentralized market. Uh, so there's several actors again, particularly in, in the Sinaloa area, uh, have sought opportunities to enter the market. So this means that we go beyond uh, larger criminal, criminal organizations like the Sinaloa cartel, like the Jalisco cartel, who dominate uh, headlines, dominate the narratives, uh, but the market is much more decentralized. Um, and the fentanyl supply chain involves, you know, possibly hundreds of independent actors uh, focusing on specific stages of the supply chain. Um, and part of this, of the evidence for this is in the prices of fentanyl, both in Mexico and, and in the United States, prices of fentanyl have plummeted uh, in a relatively short period of time, again, compared to other drugs. Uh, and for example, right now, when we were in, in, in Culiacán, uh, our sources mentioned that since the beginning of 2023, the market had become so saturated in terms of actors producing uh, the opioid, that wholesale prices had decreased considerably in a matter of months, for example. Um, if a kilo of pure fentanyl, you know, at a wholesale wholesale price, could be sold for approximately eight thousand pesos last year, so equivalent to 
$370. In early 2023, it had fallen to 3,000 pesos, right? So, you know, almost reduced by half. Um, so again, this, is, this shows that uh, several actors have, have, been in, have been getting involved in this market. Uh, there has been an overproduction of, of the opioid. Um, but uh, what we do think is that uh, large criminal organizations like those associated to the Sinaloa cartel, you know, we, we hear about the Chapitos, we hear about the Mayo, are still decisive players uh, in this market. And this is uh, the second point that I wanted to, to mention is, um, again, this, this came from, from, our, from a week of, of, of reporting, uh, you know, last week in Culiacán, is that the, the key role of, the, of these large organizations uh, is setting certain rules around the market. And over the past few months, maybe four months or so, there has been a ban on fentanyl production enforced in Culiacán, as reported uh, by our sources and also local journalists. Uh, we actually just published a story today on Inside Crime um, that I invite you to read. Um, uh, so essentially what has happened is that uh, due to increased U.S. and Mexico uh, pressure following the arrest of Ovidio Guzman at the beginning of the year uh, and following a series of indictments in April this year, what has happened is that uh, this group, uh, which you know normally called the Chapitos, have instructed to detain all fentanyl production, trafficking, and consumption in Sinaloa, and essentially execute anyone who has defied them. Um, and over the past uh, three months or so, there have been around 50 killings uh, recorded related to this, most of them in the form of disappearances. So again, showing the potential of violence, even when it comes to regulating a market like this. Um, so I think, I mean, it's important to notice, to note before I go to my final point that uh, the effects of this ban are obviously still not evident in the US market. We still see, uh, you know, that I mean, the data shows us that consumption is still increasing, that uh, the flows of fentanyl haven't really uh, been deteriorated. Uh, but as I mentioned, there has been an over uh, production of, of the opioid over the last uh, months. And obviously there's always still the possibility of production being reactivated. But what I do think this ban uh, signals to us, uh, at least temporarily, is that uh, US-Mexico counter-narcotics cooperation, at least in the short term uh, for now, um, in terms of making it more difficult for criminal organizations to operate, is essential and can have uh, important effects on the ground, uh, even if it's you know for now just a short uh, detention of, of production. Uh, so I'll leave it here, uh, but we can continue to discuss this in a bit. Thank you so much, Victoria. Uh, Dr. Arredondo, if you want to continue and give your answer. Sure. Uh, again, thank you so much for the invitation and happy to be with all these people that I admire and that I have the uh, friendships with. Uh, so I will go with a couple of things. One, that fentanyl shows us that both uh, Mexico, the U.S., and Canada are interlocked in an international system for uh, a political economy of drugs in the sense that we started seeing this introduction of fentanyl in the streets of Vancouver 2015-2016. And here in, in Canada, was particularly in British Columbia, where public health was shifted into full action to try to stop the negative consequences of this by ramping up uh, harm reduction proven evidence-based uh, practices like the distribution of naloxone, uh, increase in safe consumption services, and most importantly also addressing uh, the toxicity of the log supply by establishing drug surveilling programs, all of this funded by the government and the local level, right? And unfortunately, this is something that we have not seen in the side of Mexico. Uh, sadly, the Mexican government continues to deny that we have a consumption problem, uh, that people are dying of overdose, and we have to rely, unfortunately, on you know, the help from community organizations uh, who help us to bring things that should be legal in Mexico, like naloxone, uh, which currently it is a prescription on the medicine that is not allowed, like it was just now but recently passed in the United States, to have even in pharmacies or who even the president deem as a tool that prolongs the agony of people who use drugs. So to complement that is the civil society organizations who have thrown themselves to tackle the problem in the front lines. And we have seen in the streets, so for example, Tijuana, with the organizations that I work with, with Preven Casa or Mexicali and Berter, that you know, the people who use drugs are obviously the first ones who notice these changes in the local market. 
who are more prone to risk from not only fentanyl, but other substances that are now uh, becoming more present into the local drug supply, like silencing, like benzodiazepine. So we end up through these uh, problems of prohibition going to a deadlier substance from time to time, right? And unfortunately, we don't see the, the cooperation or the needed actions from the Mexican government that will have to set up first uh, a proper monitoring system where we can then trying to understand the toxicity level of a local drug supply to address public health alert and tell people, for example, if their substances are contaminated or not. We have been doing this work with the community organizations and it was thanks to this work that in 2018, we were able for the first time to document uh, through drug checking that we had uh, fentanyl into the streets of Tijuana. Uh, and these uh, evidence-based practices should not be controversial. We know they save lives. They know that they give us important information on what are the trends for uh, addressing these common problems. But also they tell us you know, that people who use these services and just like uh, uh, the deputy assistant secretary was telling us, you know, could engage, for example, in other activities like uh, uh, rehabilitation services. But unfortunately, on this part, Mexico has also dropped the ball. And for example, during the last year, uh, completely in the entire country, we didn't have methadone. Methadone is a medicine that is evidence-based that is uh, allowed to people who is under uh, severe addiction of opiates to stop using it if they, they wish so. And unfortunately, uh, Mexico ran out of this medicine uh, the entire year. This gave place to a big problem because then we have people who had to drop treatment, who then either relapse uh, and then die or if they relapse and then hopefully they will want to come to treatment, they will be more reluctant to do it again because they might not know if tomorrow we'll have this medicine and they will have to relapse again. So unfortunately we have a combination where uh, there's no government action and all has to be used by the community organizations. But luckily we have been able to create a synergy where we need to see this problem at the US border as a common uh, problem where we have also common solutions and organizations, community organizations like A New Path or uh, On Point have come to create these solutions to trying to understand what is affecting not only the people on the San Diego side, but also to understand that what is happening in San Diego is a reflection of what is happening in Tijuana. So I will leave it just with this, that we need to see at this topic, not only as a common topic for uh, the whole North American, but now need to find these local solutions at the border that can address these uh, public health issues in the short term. Thank you, Jaime. Maria, the floor is, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. And once again, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you. So I work for the Organization of American States at the Inter-American Drug Abuse Control Commission. And so we take a multilateral approach. It's a little bit different from some of our other colleagues, but you know, it, I, I would, not going to to repeat everything that Victoria said about the concerns about um, how the change in production is moved from from the United from where other countries and more into Mexico. But this creates a bit a, a, a broader issue and concerns for the rest of Latin America and the Caribbean, which is the reason that that we we work. And so, one of the things that we we are trying to to really do is is raise the awareness of fentanyl and other synthetic opioids. At this time, we do not see major use of these substances, but we do see isolated cases that produce a lot of, of concern. So not only um, do we worry about the ease of production and the possibility of, of movement, but we're also seeing uh, issues of, of legitimate or sort of medical grade fentanyl that's been diverted from the, the illicit market and appearing in different countries in, in the region. So we have sort of this twofold concern. One is what happens in terms of production and the potential for that to, to move and create markets in other part of the, the hemisphere, and also what's happening in terms of diverted uh, substances in the region. So as I mentioned, we're not at this time seeing large amounts of fentanyl or opioid use, but there are, there are issues related to that as well, because one of the one of the the 
with, when you're not seeing large amounts of opioids, we're also not seeing easy access to exactly the types of substances you would want to have access to in order to mitigate the response of, of an opioid crisis. So as um, Jaime was just mentioning, the harm reduction approach is very, is very important in countries like Canada, but access to naloxone and methadone are not easy in Latin America and the Caribbean. And this, this makes in general um, a, a lot of vulnerability when you're seeing um, new opioid substances appearing. We have been working very closely with Mexico for the last uh, two years, uh, helping to design not just a, a general drug information network, but to help build an early warning system on um, new psychoactive substances, in particular uh, synthetic substances. And this is actually a model that we are using all over Latin America and the Caribbean and trying to support early warning systems. So for the last 20 years, we focused on classical epidemiology when it comes to substances of use. But in the case of synthetics, we really need to pivot uh, for all of the reasons that, that we've seen historically in North America, a lot of our users are not aware of what, uh, of what is in the substances, the, sub, the fentanyl or other synthetics, they're being added to the substance as at the point of sale. So this creates a, a, a situation where we can't ask our users what they're using anymore and expect a reliable response. So we're, we're shifting and we're, we're using, we're actually using our experience with Mexico as a model for other experiences, other, other countries in the region to build early warning systems. These systems would be designed more to detect and share information with, within the, the, the different agencies that might be having to do the first response. So detection, including your national laboratories to be testing what the substances that are being seized, what the substances that are being caught on the street, what it is they contain, include toxicology when we have cases of overdose and sharing that information with your police, with your first responders, with your hospitals, with your, your treatment and detox centers so that they have the tools that they need to be able to, to properly address the, the, the um, synthetics and hopefully not, but po very possibly fentanyl and other opioids. And, and to that end, I want to also point out that there is an important role for international agencies in general in this kind of work. We uh, at the Inter-American Observatory on Drugs and CCAT in general, we liaise and work very closely with UNODC with the INCB, with the World Health Organization, with the Pan American Health Organization. And the reason that we do that is we want to ensure that all of the efforts that we're doing internationally, all the places that we're trying to focus our countries and draw their attention to, that we're all coordinating and working together in the same, in the same way. So, you know, there, there is a multilateral role here that, that I think is absolutely essential, especially when it comes to synthetics and the particular problems that synthetics raise when it, when it comes to trafficking, when it comes to chemical precursor movement, and when it comes to responses that we can build inside of countries. Um, I, I would like to really laud the, in, the global coalition effort led by the United States. I think that is a very good start to try and bring countries to the table that maybe in other situations would not be working together. And as I mentioned, the work that we're doing with Mexico, which is supported by the United States, is a good model, one that we are trying to replicate in other parts of the, of the hemisphere, where we are moving somewhat from the, the classical epidemiology to more detection and quick response when it comes to synthetics and opioids. So that's where I would begin uh, the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Daniel? Hi, everyone. Uh, I think pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, the question I've been asking myself since the beginning of the fentanyl epidemic is why? Why fentanyl? And if we understand that, uh, we can understand some of the solutions to this. So we have to remember that, um, so, so one of the facts we need to uh, recall is that fentanyl be, uh, is a problem in two countries that had prescription opioid problems, right? That is, excess uh, prescribing, excess detailing by the pharmaceutical companies and the distributors, um, excess diversion of these pills to the street, 
Uh, and that's the US and Canada. Uh, it looks like fentanyl does not exist in large ways uh, outside of these two countries. We could, you know, we could talk about Estonia. We could talk about the fentanyl problem in Australia, but they are uh, not to this magnitude. So this has come as a triple wave overdose crisis, right? The first wave was due to prescription pills, but then we were able to curtail that supply. We were able to choke that supply through drug monitoring programs um, and prescribing guidelines. Supply of opioid pills. Uh, is down 50%, right? But that unfortunately morphed into a heroin crisis. Um, uh, and here is a key figure that we need to understand. Um, we need to understand the fact that the U.S., as of 2016, it's a little bit dated in terms of this estimate, uh, is estimated to have 2.3 million heroin users. That's an enormous cohort. We've never seen numbers like that before. Half a million, three quarters of a million, perhaps, 2.3 million heroin users, mean, many of whom came out of the opioid pill uh, use, misuse uh, phenomenon, um, uh, but then became addicted to heroin, which then the third wave comes along, the heroin becomes adulterated with fentanyl, partly because there simply wasn't enough heroin to go around for 2.3 million heroin users. So fentanyl is substituted. I, I agree with the profit hypothesis. I agree that with the EC to ship smaller volumes, higher purity hypothesis. But we also have to remember that the demand side has a huge hunger uh, for opioids. Now, initially, fentanyl was not liked. Uh, if you asked in 2015 uh, what proportion of uh, heroin users liked uh, fentanyl, it'd probably be around 20%. Most people did not like it. It was an imposed phenomenon. It was not something they, they desired, but then people got used to it. You ask users now, it's probably 50, 60% who like it, uh, who and many of whom they need it, they want it because they now have high levels of dependency and heroin won't cut it anymore. So it's been a triple wave phenomenon from pills to heroin to fentanyl. We have a huge cohort that we have to deal with. Uh, and we're gonna, I'm gonna talk briefly about what that cohort um, deserves. Um, uh, if we think of it as a cohort and a need, right, with this with this huge demand, um, the response of of as as the um, uh, earlier speaker brought up of 22 billion uh, uh, for treatment uh, is actually small. It's actually too small. We need 60 to 100 billion dollars in treatment. Uh, we need expansion of harm reduction technologies, as as Jaime has championed and others. Um, well, harm reduction helps keep people alive while uh, they're working through the process of their uh, substance use disorder and maybe on their way to treatment. Harm reduction uh, is now national uh, a pillar of national drug policy in the United States, and it needs to work in cooperation across the whole spectrum of prevention and treatment needs uh, that this cohort needs and deserves. We have to beware the, the, the methamphetamine uh, problem. Uh, as well. Methamphetamines now become the fourth wave uh, and cocaine become the fourth wave of the overdose epidemic in the United States. Um, we have to be aware that interdiction sometimes creates paradox, sometimes creates perverse effects, right? So we curtailed the 1990s methamphetamine epidemic in the United States by decreasing local supply of precursor chemicals and local production. Uh, so where did it go? Across the US-Mexico border. Right, so meth production went there. Precursors are coming in from China, right? It's a very similar situation that we're seeing right now. Precursors from China, production in Mexico. Um, and the formula changed from ephedra-based, uh, that's, you know, think about over-the-counter cold medications, uh, to a nitrostyrene-based method. And guess what? The methamphetamine is now more pure and more potent than ever. So this is a complex situation. We need to think about it in a multilateral. I applaud what I'm hearing today, a multilateral approach. Um, we need to have uh, novel, uh, curated, courageous, and humane approaches to this issue. And we have to address uh, the huge cohort of demand in the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. And Gretchen, um, we will finish this round um, with you, and then we'll continue in a more dynamic conversation with all of you. Thank you. And Lila, I, I like your question very much. And um, how did we get here? And I struck because we're human beings and because human beings have sought and used drugs from, since the beginning of time. And we never seem to learn from history uh, by trying to criminalize our way out of this issue. 
Um, and then how did I get here? I speak as a parent of two sons who struggled for decades with addiction to heroin. And um, they are survivors of overdose and of a punitive criminal justice system. So we work together now for adoption of harm reduction strategies um, and outreach within the community. Um, the, the war on drugs has failed. Um, so approaches to crack down on cartels and dealers siphon resources away from approaches that do work and resources that are so badly needed to help people and communities. So the answer to the crisis is not sensationalized arrests and seizures at the border, but better access to harm reduction service on both sides of the border. And we must concentrate on addressing the demand rather than the supply side. Um, the over-involvement of law enforcement, militarized police units is, is wasting billions of dollars that are needed for treatment, recovery supports, healthcare, harm reduction services, medication-assisted treatment, Narcan, fentanyl test strips, syringe exchange, safe consumption sites, job training and housing. We really shouldn't measure our success by the amount of drug seizures at the border, but instead in how many people have access services and survived. Um, so since 2014, a new path has been doing overdose prevention trainings and Narcan distributions throughout San Diego County. We've trained over 22,500 people and have a reported 3,084 reversals, lives saved. And as part of our, Mom, of our Moms United to End the War on Drugs campaign, we've been um, distributing Narcan, sometimes out of the trunk of, of, of mom's cars throughout the nation. Uh, so San Diego is a border town, and we know that this loss of lives is a shared tragedy. Through our Mothers Across Borders uh, project, we're trying to share and support harm reduction services on both sides of the border, and we really value our partnership with Dr. Jaime Arredondo and Previn Casa and um, want to advance the work that they're doing there. And as well as in Canada, we work with Moms Stop the Harm. We're deeply concerned about all of the misinformation about fentanyl leading to public hysteria and a misguided return to drug war tactics. This is counter to the widespread belief that drug use should be handled as a public health issue. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Gretchen. And now we're going to move into, um, I'm going to have some, I've drafted some questions. Um, the first one is going to be directed towards Victoria, just because of what you uh, mentioned uh, during your, your remarks. But please, anybody feel free to jump in if you would like to um, answer this question. And if not, I have a variety of questions um, for all of you. And so, Victoria, I thought it was extremely interesting that you said by 2023, the market for fentanyl and opioid or synthetic opioids has been saturated. Um, I, you, you also mentioned, um, you know, that the Sinaloa cartel and the Jalisco New Generation cartel still, you know, are key players. They have become dominant fentanyl sources, along with other Mexican TCOs. Um, and these TCOs, yes, they're producing fentanyl themselves using precursor chemicals obtained from a variety of sources, including Chinese TCOs and legitimate companies. But my question to you and, and, and others is, could Mexican cartels, similar to what happened, for example, with methamphetamine, seek independence from outside chemical suppliers and produce their own precursors from scratch? So therefore, they wouldn't have this dependence from outsiders, and it could actually even bring the price um, lower than, than the, the prices that you mentioned um, during your remarks? I think that's a great question. It's one of made myself several times. Um, what we've seen now is at least, we haven't seen that uh, producer, fentanyl producers in Mexico are completely independent from source, from uh, external sources, right? For example, in 2019, uh, China enforced uh, several bans on fentanyl itself, but also on a bunch of precursors, uh, mainly ANPP and NPP, which are uh, through some, one of the methods to produce fentanyl that are the key precursors, right? So what we saw is that after uh, it got more difficult to obtain these uh, these precursors, they did um, resort to. So if we see, for example, the the chain of of, of chemical reactions, so to say, they went uh, steps behind uh, those precursors to produce them in Mexico. So for example, right now in the interviews we did, uh, several of them, you know, they, it was agreed that uh, they can't get the, like the direct pre precursor anymore, but they've gone uh, steps behind in, in the 
in, in the chemical chain to produce that precursor that they can't get from China anymore. Um, however, uh, I do not see that they have right now the ability to produce fentanyl from scratch, right? Uh, it's, it's, you know, the further back you go on the chain, it's more complicated, it's more dangerous. Uh, you do need then more, uh, more investment because you may need, for example, uh, to control for certain conditions to 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 be able to. I mean, I'm not a chemist, right? But that this is what I'm. Uh, what what chemists uh, normally uh, argue is that uh, the further you go back on the on the chemical chain, is that it becomes more difficult uh, to produce fentanyl. So that's why what we had seen over the past years, it, it was just basic chemistry uh, closer to the end of 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 of, of the production chain. Um, happening in Mexico, right? But we are seeing that they're trying to go a bit, a, a bit uh, further back in the chain. Um, I don't know if, if they'll reach a point of becoming completely independent, um, again, because of, of the difficulty and, and the risk they face, because obviously we know that uh, production in Mexico is not taking place in, you know, sophisticated laboratories, it takes place in very rudimentary laboratories, uh, you know, most of the times not with uh, the right, uh, you know, security gear uh, or protection gear. Uh, and there have also been, you know, a bunch of accidents uh, where cooks have either been burned or have been, you know, killed uh, because of, you know, not conducting these reactions in a safe manner. Uh, so the risk increases. Um, so I don't know if, if, if we'll reach that point because uh, at least what we're seeing now is, you know, obviously the further you go back on the chemical chain, uh, the substances are more widely used uh you know in several different uh legal industries so it's it's not you know it's not about obviously regulating these these chemicals because it gets more difficult for the private sector you know to uh to produce you know whatever they need to produce right um so i, I what i think will happen is that they will still rely on outside um um suppliers um but constantly adapt uh to to the substances that they can't get right which again uh is another challenge that fentanyl poses like for example in you know to produce cocaine you need coca leaves right to produce fentanyl you need certain precursors but if you don't have them you can go back and produce them yourself um so that uh, poses another challenge for law enforcement as well because it, you know um and i just want to echo sorry if i'm extending myself a bit but i just want to echo what uh, gretchen just mentioned about the war on drugs uh we have to rethink how we think about, you know, interdiction and regulating uh, certain substances, because in the case, specifically in the case of fentanyl, it becomes a constant game of cat and mouse, right? You regulate a chemical, then uh, producers can go back and create that chemical themselves with more available substances. Um, so, you know, um, it poses new challenges as well uh, in terms of, you know, trying to uh, asphyxiate uh, the supply side. In drug policy, we call this the balloon hypothesis, and that is when you squeeze the supply side balloon, it per pokes out in some other direction. But here's the, the way I take the balloon hypothesis a step further. So it's not that just the balloon pops out in the opposite direction where you squeeze, it pops out in an unknown way, in an unknown part of the balloon, right? So that's the challenge we face, uh, is we simply don't know what'll happen if we keep squeezing the fentanyl meets precursor meets pre-precursor meets pre-pre-precursor. Um, I just highlight lately the latest paradox, which is that of the methamphetamine. We went from a ubiquitous uh, precursor, uh, sorry, not a ubiquitous, a, well, ubiquitous in terms of volume, but a narrowly used uh, precursor, which was over-the-counter cold medicines, to nitrostyrene as a precursor. Um, nitrostyrene is used broadly in industry, very hard to control unless we want to shut down the perfume industry and a couple others. Um, and so, and it's producing a better, more potent, more pure methamphetamine than ever before. So, so beware the paradoxes, beware the perverse outcomes of our interdiction efforts. Daniel, if I can follow up on a question for you, I mean, you mentioned three waves, right? And I was reading actually a, a, an article this weekend um, where researchers were sort of saying that the U.S. has entered this fourth wave, right? Or so-called mm -hmm. fourth wave of the opioid crisis, which is sort of characterized by overdose, overdose deaths caused by the combination of stimulants and fentanyl, right? So we're not just focusing on one, but now they're they're mixing it, right? We, we've heard from others that some people don't even know that they're taking um, fentanyl. Um, so how do you how do you solve this? Like how 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 do you prevent another wave, right? Or or right. another substance being with included with other stimulants? Like it seems like an ever growing problem with a very dynamic environment. Well, again, going for fundamental answers, the, the answer of why 
and whom and how. Well, some of the basic epidemiological questions we ask. So whom is this fourth wave affecting? And by the way, I coined the term. Um, and um, uh, it, it is the rise of co-use of methamphetamine and fentanyl and meth um, uh, cocaine and fentanyl. Um, it comes out uh, in an understandable way. That is, uh, we across history have seen cycles of stimulants and, and opioids, uh, uppers and downers, as you might say, uh, across across generations. Uh, but more importantly, it's coming out of, of this cohort that I mentioned, right? 2.3 million heroin users who are highly dependent on fentanyl. And guess what? Over time, they become tolerant. Even if it's 40 times heroin, you still become tolerant to it, right? And so they're looking for something to give it boost again. The best way to do that is with a stimulant. It used to be cocaine and heroin, the so-called speedball, classic, well-liked combination. And now we have the so-called goofball. It's not called a goofball anymore, but uh, historically unique uh, and, and, and um, underutilized combination. But now highly utilized because the fentanyl, the opioid component, is strong enough to meet mano a mano with the super strong methamphetamine that's being produced. Um, so the way we address this uh, is, again, understanding the cohort, and, and, and addressing their harm reduction, prevention, and treatment needs uh, in a way that's courageous and humane. Thank you. Um, yeah, Jaime, go ahead, and then we'll go with Maria. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I, I did wanted to put some mentions in there. I could guess it is, it is important to understand that this combination of stimulants and, and overage use that is creating this new wave, but also just like Gretchen mentioned, we also have to have clear information, right? Because I've been hearing a lot like how common it's to say like now is fentanyl is in everything. And that's not necessarily true, right? What we have learned through these so drug checking services that lead to these monitoring systems is that, for example, what we saw here in Canada, less than 5% of methamphetamine tested positive for uh, fentanyl uh, and less than, I think, around 3% for cocaine. Uh, and then when we replicated, for example, this experiment in Mexico, we did a study for 500 samples of stimulants in different cities in Mexico, and all of them came out negative, right? So it's really what is telling us is that the substances are separated, like are really well defined. We have our meth, which is generally meth. We have our the street opiates who are systematically now laced with fentanyl, and people choose to combine it, just like someone will have a tequila with a beer like they will have any other combination of substances, right? But then we need to educate people that some of these combinations are risky for their health. Uh, and I like that point that Dan made in the sense that we have a cohort and if we can learn something, for example, from the Europeans, like take the case of the Netherlands and the Dutch, is that they had a cohort of injection drug users in the 70s and 80s, and they invested heavily on harm reduction, on housing and other policies that they were able to isolate these cover with these necessary public health uh, solutions to save lives and to put so those people in need of substance use services into proper treatment, either be with methadone, but let's just stop talking about methadone. There are new substances that can actively uh, uh, lead people to, to, uh, to treatment. For example, we have heroin maintenance programs that have been in Europe for 20, 30 years who are, uh, you know, show that they work. And then we are still stuck with these old notions that we need to stop in, in, in methadone, where probably what we need now because of this new stronger combination of substances is probably move to these safer supply solutions of so, uh, programs like here in Victoria, where they prescribe fentanyl for some people who are needed uh, or methadone, uh, heroin system programs, suboxone, other ranges of medicines and options that we need to start looking to isolate this cohort and give a specific needs to this new problem. Maria, I just a real quick uh, uh, thank you, uh, Jaime. Uh, you you know you always speak my language. Thank you. Um, the, but we also need to engage youth. Um, reality based drug education for youth, including all the the the, the historical harm reduction successes uh, globally. Um, and, and advice to uh, test before ingesting. Um, youth can tend to be left out of it, like we're trying to protect them and try to scare our, scare them uh, from, from experimenting instead of um, treating them um, as partners in, in, for possible solutions. 
Thank you, Maria, go ahead. Thank you very much. I, I think we're moving towards some some general ideas, but I, I want to circle back to something Dan said in, in his words, um, his remarks earlier, which which has to do with the waves and your question about the fourth wave. And I, I think embedded in all of this is a very clear, what should be a clear policy lesson, one that we should really be paying attention to. And in particular, when it comes to the consumption side, and, and I think it was Jaime who talked about the balloon effect. Um, there are some predictable ways, though, the balloon effect will function. And one very clear one is that if we have a population that we know is dependent on a substance, if our only policy response is a prohibitionist response that reduces access to that substance, we are forcing our population to seek an alternative. We are not ending the problem. We are forcing it into another direction. That's exactly what happened with the fentanyl problem. And in fact, it's a policy lesson we should be taking with any drug use in general. When we know we have a dependent population on a substance, if our only response is prohibition side, we are not really addressing the problem. We are in fact forcing it into something else. And what, what happened with our in our history of fentanyl in some ways should have been predictable because we were keeping people from being accessing something that they actually needed to use. So this is one of the lessons I think that, that we should at least be taking with us at a minimal, at a very minimal, um, uh, minimal approach is that we may have a supply side problem. That is definitely the way fentanyl began. It was it began with series of supply excess um, in it, it not only in prescription and listed amounts, but then later you know excess access to things that maybe shouldn't have been. But the response to that needs to be a public health response. It has to be. So we have we may have a supply side problem. But the response has to be on the health side. It's the only way that we can actually address what is happening with the users themselves. If we don't address what's happening with the users, we're really not addressing the mortality and the morbidity that is associated with, with, um, with the consumption. So, you know, I, I think there, there's a there's a policy lesson in here, but it's one we tend we tend to keep leaving behind us. And there are predictable ways that we can expect things to change if we're only taking prohibitionist responses. And so, you know, we always, you know, I, I, I understand why politicians love to increase police and clamp down, but it maybe makes the population feel better in a general way, but it doesn't actually solve the problem. It usually makes it worse. And so we, we, we need to really be thinking carefully, you know, and, and as we move forward again in a multilateral approach, what are policies that we know work and what are parts of policies that don't work so well? You know, and I think there's some really important lessons that we can take from, from what's happened with fentanyl. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. If I can sort of pose a question to, to all of you, I mean, uh, Maria, you, you kind of alluded to this as well as Deputy Assistant Ser Secretary Phillips. There, there has to be a multilateral approach to solving this problem, as well as even a bilateral or trilateral approach if we consider North America or the U.S.-Mexico relationship. Um, that said, um, Jaime, you, you spoke about the fact that the Mexican government, you know, is not we're not seeing the actions needed um, in order to really combat this crisis. And yet we see from really high public officials in the Mexican government, particularly the president himself, saying that, you know, fentanyl is not an issue in Mexico and that, it, you know, they're not producing or consuming fentanyl. And so we have this sort of um, discourse or message that it's it's a U.S. problem. It's a, you know, consumption problem, like get that under control. But in order to really solve this issue, it's going to require multilateral, bilateral approaches to solving it. I mean, we just heard what we see from even Gretchen, right? Or Jaime, you said what happens in Tijuana uh, or what happens in San Diego is a reflection of what happens in Tijuana and maybe vice, vice versa. But that's not necessarily an approach that perhaps the Mexican government is taking. So what would your recommendations be in order to really bolster security cooperation in a moment where, in reality, the trust between agencies and security uh, institutions on both sides of the border has been debilitated in, in the last you know few years. Yeah, unfortunately, like like you say, I mean, the Mexican government decides to deny the reality, and unfortunately, the hangover for the next government is going to be really rough. 
right? I mean, we have no data for the last six years about what is the consumption of substances in Mexico. And the new survey that is gonna be conducted by the current government is not gonna follow the same uh, methodology than previous uh, surveys and addiction. So we won't be able to compare data, which is then is useful to say we don't have a problem. But I can tell you, we have a problem. I see it in the streets of Tijuana when we see people die or where we have people uh, come back from a, an overdose. And that's not a, a myth, right? We've seen it, we're trying to document it uh, through our academic research, but unfortunately there's so much that we can be doing because we don't have the resources, right? Uh, so what can we do unfortunately right now for the governments of the US and Canada? Uh, first to understand that it's a common problem that we are outsourcing drug production to our partner on the South. Uh, and then for example, we had last month around 180 uh, deaths of homicides in Tijuana. That's the same amount of overdose deaths of British Columbia. So we can compare the problem. It's creating both harm in both uh, countries. And we need to bring these solutions where unfortunately right now we need to bypass the Mexican government and go to work directly with the community organizations who are generating one, an immediate response to those needs on the ground, and two, the data that will allow us to understand into the future what will be the challenges that the new incoming government will have in 2024. Uh, so I think that's the, the mission right now, to start setting up like the work that you're doing, some guidelines and points into what are the solutions, evidence-based solutions that we need, and then to try to understand to the governments in the US uh, and Canada that uh, this current Mexican government is not going to deal with the problem. We need to bypass it and then hope for better solutions into the future. Uh, and just one quick brief there. Uh, I think it was Dan who, who coined the term about the, the balloon effect. I was gonna say that we do have the iron law provision and we understand that as we make one substance more difficult to get, another one will replace. We saw that in Tijuana before the show up of fentanyl for a brief period of time. We saw crocodile into the streets and it created horrible wounds. Uh, and now we've seen more deaths uh, with this introduction of, of, of this white powder uh, mixed with fentanyl. So we will always send that up if we just try to look into the supply side with imperfect solutions. Thank you. Um, to throw just one more complicated layer into what is already a very complex um, issue, um, we've seen in the United States that the majority of over deaths and, and you know, fatal deaths are coming from uh, 14 and 23 year olds who are now getting access to opioids and to fentanyl through social media platforms, right? Um, so looking at it from also a multilateral approach, how do, are there any recommendation in your research and your investigations as to how to properly or or more have stricter regulations on some of these platforms, particularly because, you know, it's the younger population that are constantly on these social media platforms and they have now access uh, to these substances and any dealer that has access to the internet can basically also sell a product. So just something to think about, but um, please, anybody want to jump in here? I'll just jump in with the, the, the size of the problem, right? My team and I have estimated that uh, the American streets are, are getting 100 million um, fentanyl-laced pills on an annual basis. We published that paper a couple of years ago. Um, this is an enormous problem. And you have to think that the people who are going to access those those pills are going to be occasional users, recreational users, young users. And we're starting to see that in the data. As you say, this sort of a bimodal um, um, uh, death distribution at this point it includes a spike among young people and young people are getting exposed to pills they don't fully understand. So as Gretchen brought up, as Jaime brought up, um, uh, we need drug checking. We need drug checking. We need naloxone everywhere. We need naloxone in the high schools. We need naloxone in the college. We need naloxone in the family medicine cabinet. Um, uh, if your kids are having uh, a party of any level and and you're you know you have your eyes covered and your ears plugged that you're you know there's no alcohol there's no substances there are substances there will be alcohol make sure naloxone is around uh, and make sure the kids know how to use it um, a testing drugs before uh, consumption uh, is a great idea pills are a little bit complex because you have to kind of test the whole pill um, to miss the hot spot to not miss the hot spot uh, but I'll stop with that I, I want to reiterate what I said about uh, the the need for honest, safety first drug education is 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 critical. Um, we've been handling this by trying to scare kids away from experimenting, but guess what? They're going to experiment anyway, and so they need to have tools such as 
testing. And, but also I think we, we have a problem. We don't have their trust because we've been lying to them for so many years and scaring them instead of dealing with them as real partners. And so knowing that, that, that experimentation is going to happen, they are going to be finding drugs, uh, giving them the tools to save their lives, to save the the friend. I can't tell you how difficult it was for us to get Narcan into the hands of youth. We're finally making headways, but we've been working on this for years. And the, the idea was, well, no, kids can't know about uh, overdoses. In the meantime, they're overdosing in school bathrooms. So it, it's, it's, it's really uh, time to uh, stop this kind of false protection of kids and instead invite them to be partners. And I would like just to compliment with that really quick. I think Rachel knows pretty well. Uh, she's taught me a lot is to also end, end the stigma, right? Like we need to end completely stigma. If we keep bashing people that you're worthless, uh, that as we see in Mexican TV, that, you know, you try something, you're going to die like the Mexican president says in six months without teeth and your life is going to go to hell. Then why would you approach health services trying to seek help? Uh, really, I think at the core of the issue is how do we look at substance use? How do we destigmatize these issues so people can have like an honest talk about it with your friends, with your family, with your kids, and then just, you know, stop being afraid of talking about this issue. Victoria, Maria, do you have any final comments before we move into conclusions? I, I don't really have a lot new to add there, you know, other than we we also are seeing a, a lot of the drug sales have moved online. They're using apps and so on to to um, move substances. Um, I I think that some excellent ideas were were already mentioned by Gretchen and the others the, and the the issue of stigma. What I what I perhaps would say is it also just general education. You know what what is likely to be out there. Um, the pill testing is important. Um, on our side, we, we aim towards national laboratories and making sure that, that what substances are circulating and it can be tested regularly and be known and share that information with the, with the key players in it, within each country. Um, you know, in the case of Mexico, we are working with them to build an early warning system that would do some of that as well. Um, but, it, you know, the, I think the, um, the, point that was made about working at the community level is is key as well, not just the national. Thanks. One thing I'm going to add, and it's probably, I mean, just a little bit adding to what Jaime said, is that um, what we start, because obviously the, the consumption crisis in Mexico started at the border, but we started to see, you know, small case or a bit of cases, you know, in cities like Guadalajara, like Aguascalientes, even like Culiacán, um, but the medical services weren't prepared, right? Also because, maybe because of stigma, maybe because of the narrative that the, you know, even the Mexican president was uh, promoting of, you know, this is not, a, this, this just does not exist in Mexico, it's not a problem. Uh, so medical services were also met with, you know, we don't have enough tools either to, you know, address the, the, the overdoses or even to identify them. Uh, so I think that's also something uh, just, you know, to add uh, and to keep in mind. Thank you, Victoria. We have about eight minutes um, to sort of close this conversation, but I do want to give each and every one of you about one or two minutes to sort of just, you know, give your conclusions on, on how to possibly solve this and how to better uh, multilateral and bilateral efforts to combat this opioid crisis. So why don't we start off with you, Maria? Thank you. I, I would my, my two minute uh, wrap up from the multilateral side is, you know, this is something that that we're working with uh, throughout the Latin America and then the Caribbean. Um, it's been it's been embedded in our hemispheric drug strategy for the last five years, um, and that is to support early warning systems within our countries. I think it's very clear from from what it's already been stated, our classical epidemiology doesn't always work when it comes to some of these new substances, fentanyl and other synthetics. Um, the work that Mexico is doing right now to build their early warning system is an excellent first step. There are a lot of details that go into that and it's a slow process, but it's something that really can serve as a model for other countries. And we're, we're hoping that 
when the system is working that we're going to be able to have a better sense of what is actually circulating in the market um, so that we can share that information with the, with the actors on, on the front lines. Uh, and I'm sure my colleagues on the rest of the panel will have far more detailed and, uh, and other interesting responses on, on, I think there's been some great things that have been already mentioned on how this might be approached at a, at a more granular level. But you know, looking at the multilateral approach, it's very important for all the countries to be working together on this because this is not an issue that is isolated to one single country. It crosses borders, and so we need to be working together in the same direction. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, thank you. Um, so, in order to reduce the the main problem, which is deaths right, the excess number of deaths caused by uh, this phenomenon, uh, we need to have a public health, public safety partnership. Uh, we need to understand the drug supply, right? It's a, it's a key thing that public health has been kept out of, right? Because criminal justice, public safety feels like they own that data and don't wanna share it. We need to understand the flows of drugs. We need to understand the combinations. We need to understand contamination. We need to certainly have early warning systems about new drugs. Uh, new permutations come in, uh, and that's going to require cooperation across this, uh, I'll just say, political divide between public safety and public health. We need to keep the North Star, uh, our, our North Star of reducing death. Uh, moving along the continuum, we need prevention efforts, both the primary prevention, as, as Gretchen has brought up, uh, but also secondary prevention, and that's harm reduction. People that are currently using need, deserve, want drug checking technologies, clean needles, safe smoking equipment, uh, overdose prevention, naloxone and the like. And then moving the continuum to treatment, we need more uh, openness, more, more compassion. We need to combine harm reduction with treatment so that there's more of a fluidity between the two, not just if you come to my clinic, you have to operate by these rules, right? I chide my addiction medicine colleagues all the time about having too many rules in their clinics. We need to have much more open uh, openness. Uh, and speaking of openness, I applaud this uh, this, this panel, the, the Mexico Institute for creating uh, this binational, bilateral um, uh, openness uh, to addressing this problem. So thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much for being here, Daniel. Let's go with Jaime Gretchen and we'll finish with Victoria. Thank you, just like Dan said, for opening these spaces. I think what is needed is to start and continue the conversation, right? We cannot deny reality. The numbers are hitting us. The reality is hitting on the streets, both in Mexico and the rest of the countries in North America. Uh, I would say, obviously, everything that Dan has mentioned, uh, but also I would like to, to, to mention that we are in a risky time where harm reduction is now becoming like an evil word, where there's several places both in San Francisco or any cities or other big cities in the United States, San Diego, for example, or other cities that, you know, people are frustrated and they're, they're seeing that people are dying and they're looking for an excuse. And their excuse is saying like, see, we told you harm reduction is not working. We need to cut it. Uh, but I will go back to that point made by Dan uh, a while ago, which is we have a cohort, the generation of people who are now uh, into this problem. And these solutions will take a generational solution which will mean a 10, 20 year approach. And just because a couple of years or because you see one dot on the line that apparently doesn't hold into the trend, uh, that doesn't mean that the solution is not working. It means that we need to double out, double down our effects or, or sorry, our efforts into putting these things into the streets. We need uh, treatment, new generation treatment that is available, take out the taboo about hair and maintenance treatment and other substitute or safer sub supply for those people who are in need. But also we need to put pressure on the Mexican government to acknowledge the reality because if we continue to deny it, people will continue dying. And my last thing will be, uh, let's support our community organizations. They are there every day, just like a new path and many others trying to save lives. Most of the times without funding, most of the times volunteering, and this shouldn't be uh, the necessary of heroes. We need people who are getting paid for the efforts to save lives. And hopefully governments will understand how important it is to support our community organizations. Uh, thank you for this panel. It actually has really boosted my spirits, a dream to, to be working together globally on, on this sh shared issue. You know, one thing that hasn't been said is that the, the truth is that fentanyl has been um, used to treat pain for decades. So it's really not a devil drug. Um, and here's where stigma comes in. 
um, policies that uh, that try to crack down on it can it can add add to stigma. Um, so we can't uh, we can't step back to failed drug war tactics in dealing with it. And there's a real danger in calling it a poisoning. I think there there's a there's a, a stigmatizing purpose to calling it poisoning, and going after the drug dealers who are most often people who are struggling with substance use disorder themselves. Um, so retribution, um, punishment is useless. Um, it adds to stigma and it adds to that sense of hopelessness and helplessness. Um, but compassion and tolerance is restorative. And so that has to be our vision of moving forward. Um, I agree with everything that, that my fellow panelists have said, and I just wanted to add, just in the you know focusing on on the production side of of illicit uh, fentanyl, is that I agree that uh, a supply chain approach is not enough. Some of it is necessary, but on its own, it's not enough because it becomes, as we've discussed, a constant game of cat and mouse. It becomes you know it creates a balloon effect. It creates more problems. Um, so one thing I would add, just not to overstep on what everyone has said, is I think we also need to bring in the private sector into these conversations. You know, when we're thinking about the supply chain of the precursor chemicals that are, you know, being diverted to produce illicit fentanyl in Mexico, the private sector is mostly left out of the conversation. And obviously that creates, again, a bunch of problems uh, in terms of regulation uh, of substances that it affects, uh, you know, uh, legal the legal economy. So I think it's... I Again, you know, when speaking about bringing different actors into the conversation and making this a much more comprehensive uh, strategy, I think we should also uh, be mindful of also bringing uh, those actors uh, into the conversation. Thank you. And again, on behalf of the Mexico Institute and my two co-sponsors, the ONC and UCSD, we really want to thank everybody that's here with us today viewing and, and, and discussing this issue. So to our great group of panelists. Thank you again um, for your time and for your insight. A special thanks as well to Das Phillips and to Ambassador Wayne, who always provides such value and insight into what the Mexico Institute does. And now it is my pleasure to turn it over to Cecilia Farfan, who's the head of research at the Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies at the University of California, San Diego, for closing remarks. Ceci, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Lila. And on the contrary, thank you so much for organizing and allow us to co-sponsor this. Um, we have been working on this issue with Ambassador Wayne for years, and it's great to see so many uh, friendly faces um, in the panel. I would just like to um, do the closer remarks by underscoring some points that I think were made today and that I would like to you know, leave as um, starters for the next conversation that hopefully we will have. I think there is clearly an agreement that we're not going to arrest ourselves out of this problem. And so, you know, having said this, I think it's important to then look at what can actually be done. I think it is clear that we need better data, not only in Mexico, which certainly there's um, a lot of, you know, needs in that area, but certainly in the U.S. as well. And I think particularly to address this misinformation that Gretchen alluded to, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding around the benefits of fentanyl, how it's used in um, the medical field, and, you know, why it's important for people to have access uh, to painkillers um, on a general level. I would also underscore that, you know, I applaud the multilateral spaces and what it's being done there, but I think there's a lot of opportunity there to bring uh, subnational initiatives into conversation with what these multilateral spaces have done. We have seen this happen in other areas. We see it happening, for example, uh, when it comes to illicit firearms trafficking. And I think there's a lot, I think the good news is that there's a lot that these uh, organizations like A New Path, like Preven Casa, like Verde have learned um, in the course of providing these services. And so there's no need to reinvent the wheel. There's evidence there that I think these multilateral spaces could definitely benefit um, from. I think it's also evident from this conversation today that there is no really uh, an intervention that could really affect the supply side to the point of reducing profit and then disincentivizing illicit actors from supplying the fentanyl market. Having said this, though, I would absolutely echo what Dan mentioned of the need to understand the supply side to have a better understanding, certainly, of what is happening with the cohort and, you know, how dynamics are changing. So even if 
there's not going to be an intervention that raises the cost of producing substances to the point that it would, you know, disincentivize these actors from entering the market. We still need to understand how that works. And I agree that for a very long time, this information has been treated as a state secret. And certainly there's intelligence that, you know, we understand cannot be shared, but no one is asking for that kind of information. There's a lot that we can do to help understand um, the challenges better if there are sharing agreements in place. And I think we can be creative as to how those can happen. And I will close um, on what I think it's a, it's a positive note. I would also call attention to the fact that this demand for fentanyl, and perhaps this is a silver lining, has produced a window of opportunity in areas that no other drug policy has able to produce. And by that, I mean, we know that growers uh, of opium poppy in Mexico, in some areas have lost their income which means that they are very open now to looking into other activities that will allow them to have those subsistence levels that producing uh, opium allowed them to. And so we should be thinking about very creatively about this window of opportunity that right now exists in some territories, in some produ producing regions, where state actors and international actors could actually come in and offer an alternative. And I'm not talking about the traditional coffee model, but certainly talking about, you know, alternatives for illicit livelihood that is also one that has lower levels, if not absence of violence. And so fentanyl in that way has produced what no other drug policy has been able to produce. And it's the space and the ability to go into these territories and offer a different uh, or offer an alternative. And so I think that's something that certainly we should be thinking about as we move forward and certainly as we focus on the public health side of things. So thank you again for organizing and it's a pleasure for us to co-sponsor this event. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day and we look forward to working with you in the near future. Thank you, everybody.